Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Multiculturalism, Social Issues, and Games. My name is Chris, and I will be uh, one of the moderators tonight. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and quickly uh, switch over to the slides. So our presentation today is uh, brought to you with a collaboration of the Learning Consortium of Colorado, as well as the Games and Simulations Network from ISTE. And also, uh, there's also lots of good resources here at the Metagame Book Club. Uh, so if uh, some of the terms you hear tonight, such as interactive fiction uh, or some other pieces, feel free to check out the Metagame Book Club as we've done some, we've got a lot of great resources there uh, for you to go ahead and check out and read up on. So in addition to myself, uh, Trish Cloud is also serving as a moderator uh, on the uh, on the actual Padlet that we have as the back channel of this presentation. And our speakers tonight are Sherry Jones. Hi, everybody. And Kay Novak. All right, so as I said before, uh, we have a Padlet tonight. Uh, that is the URL, so we'll leave it up here for a little bit. Uh, and all you do for the Padlet is you just simply hit the plus button that you'll see down in the lower right-hand corner, a little box will pop up, and you just start typing your comments into there. And when you're done, just click off your box, and you'll go ahead and you will post your comment. And like I said, our moderators will check that out, and we'll make sure that we go ahead and we uh, get that back to the panelists so that way they're able to respond to your questions in real time. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and turn things over to Sherry. Hey, everybody. This is Sherry. Um, we want to start uh, this presentation by just uh, be forthcoming on the intention of this presentation. This presentation is a response to that recent immigration order on January 27, 2017, that will suspend entry to all refugees to the U.S. for 120 days. Um, so the seven countries are, are banned specifically. They are 90 days before all refugees see us. It's 120 days. Um, and we wanted to bring this into the discussion because naturally, uh, uh, those of us who are in education, um, as well as working in um, educational institutions, are impacted by disorder. We have students from different backgrounds, different diversity in our classroom. So we felt that it was very important for us to be proactive and mention this particular order. In, collectively think about what we can do to help our students. And next. Okay. So we want to talk about the idea of learning history as a way of uh, remembering and coping with the current situation right now. Okay. So the way we want to introduce our students to th this current situation is to look back into historical events regarding immigration and how it led to the formation of the United States. Um, and particularly, we think that, at least for my own position, I wanted to forward that. I think it's easier for students to understand the relevance of this conversation if they really understand exactly what it means to be a refugee and the difficulties that refugees encounter. And the definition of a refugee is someone who is um, flying, uh, uh, escaping from conflict, escaping from problems in specific places and seeking, seeking help, seeking shelter. So that's a refugee. Um, we can go next. OK. So we're going to do this presentation by experiencing the history of immigration through games. Um, and the position is that games can serve as vehicles for telling stories. So what we mean by that is that there's the big debate on what games exactly are. But games can be used to tell great stories. And some game designers are starting to develop games that are based on real historical events. So we would like to, through this presentation, uh, introduce a few games that depict some realistic portrayals of what immigrants actually experience in the US, as well as the plight of refugees from other countries. So next. So I'll bring it back to Kay and Chris. OK. So um, what we're going to do here now is we're going to look at this interactive fiction piece. Now, for those of you not familiar with interactive fiction, a lot of interactive fiction, um, if you think about um, choose your own adventure books, books where there was a branching storyline, that'll give you an idea of what interactive 
a, fi a fiction is like. So it's a branching storyline that you follow through. And what we're going to do now is we're going to have Chris. We're going to have Chris here um, go ahead and and click through this with us. But I'm going to ask the the other panelists at at, at certain times um, if they'll if they'll help me make the decisions. Now, the, for this interactive fic fiction, um, we'll just get started. Okay, so. Go ahead, Chris, and click on the website. And this is available for you online. You could definitely have this in your classroom, say up on if you have any kind of electronic whiteboard. You could pull it up, you could read it, or you could have your students read it. And we consider this something that could be a prompt could be part of a discussion. This is something that you could give them as an assignment to play on their own and then come back and play as a class. So with this interactive fiction, the first part of it is it has it has you um, looking at your, your character. And for this one, you don't really have a choice. There's one character for this interactive fiction, and that's Fred, 23-year-old male, Welder, Oakland, California. So let's go ahead and click on that. Okay, your name is Fred Suzuki. You were born in Oakland, California in 1919, the third of four sons. Your parents immigrated from Japan in 1905, and you and your siblings have worked in the family nursery in nearby San Leandro since you were a kid. You were never a big fan of school, and when you graduated from high school, you decided to join the Navy. You were rejected, however, because of stomach ulcers that have plagued you since adolescence. But you still want to contribute to the war effort, so you become a welder at the local shipyard, and you've been working there ever since. Since Pearl Harbor, though, everything's changed. You got fired from your welding job as soon as your supervisor found out that he had a Jap on the payroll. Last month, the government issued a curfew for all Japanese, even American-born ones like you and your brothers. People are talking about U.S. concentration camps being built in the Midwest. Everyone's terrified. So, only one option, play is Fred. Click on that. Last week, flyers started appearing on all the telephone poles. All the Japanese Americans in the area are being told to report to assembly centers in Oakland next Saturday. Your girlfriend, Ida, she's Italian, has been begging you not to go. She told you about this doctor friend she has, a plastic surgeon who can totally transform your face so you don't even look Japanese anymore. This might be your key to staying out of the camp. And with Ida, she asked you to make an appointment with the doctor. He'll do the cosmetic surgery for a discount. Okay. Uh, these are quite heavy decisions. This is something that you can stop, pause, have your class discuss. And I really think here there's so many components that you can be talking about here. If you're in a classroom where students have computers, you can have them looking up things to see, uh, to see how accurate this is. You can also have your students talking about how this is just the precursor. There aren't internment camps yet, but people are starting to hear people are starting to hear rumors about this. Okay? The thing of it is there might be a video from someone who was actually in the Japanese internment camp that you might want to pull that you might want to pull up. Um, most of the, most of the sur survivors from this now were little children when, when they were in it, but still, there's some powerful stories there. So, what we're going to do now is um, I'm going to ask my group, do they want to make a choice? And I'm going to hand it over to Chris to go ahead and make the choice and read us through some. All right, sure. So, what do you think we should do? So, should we go in for the surgery, or should we not see the doctor? So, I lean towards not seeing the doctor, but then again, I'm just not that into cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic surgery. So, uh, what do you what do you think, Sherry? Well, in this kind of situation, given what we know in the in the past, I think that if we don't go see the doctor, there could be consequences, and mm -hmm. 
it would be it would be making you prepare. And I, I I'm thinking about going in for the surgery. <laughs> All right. So Trish, I guess you'd be the tiebreaker. I would um I would go for the surgery. All righty. So we are going for surgery. We have a little bit of reservations about it, but we're gonna go for the surgery. All right. It says you got what's called a epicathal fold surgery on your eyelids. It hurt pretty bad. But it's been a week and the swelling has gone down. You look a little bit you look a little different. But your friends and even Ida say you still look Japanese. Ida says you should change your name though. And you have a Japanese friend who started to claiming to be a native of, of Hawaiian, sorry, be claiming to be of native Hawaiian heritage. Maybe you can pretend to be mixed. And that way the government can't put you into the camp. Either way, you decide soon. It's only three days until you're supposed to report to the assembly center in Oakland. Your parents say they're going and your brothers too. So what do we want to do? Do we want to report to the center or do we want to stay at home? I don't know. I still feel, I mean, if I'm Frank, I still feel pretty sore. I'm going to say probably want to stay home and heal up some more. I agree with Chris. I think if you did your surgery, I mean, what's the point of doing the surgery if you're going to report directly to the center? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I go for stay at home, too. <laughs> all righty. Stay so, home. Stay home. Stay okay, home. We're, we're all home bodies tonight, so we'll go ahead and we'll stay at home. All right, it's been three weeks since all the Japanese left for the assembly center, but you stayed inside your apartment, and while you expect to get a knock on your door from the police almost every day, you still haven't heard a thing. Money is getting very tight, though. Ida brings you food and cigarettes and tries to give you a few bucks when she can. The relationship is starting to get a bit little strained. You guys can't go out and do anything, and Ida has always loved to go dancing. Mostly you just sit and mope around your apartment, but you're going to need to find some crash cash quick. Uh, because rent is due in two weeks, and the last thing you need is a landlord poking into the personal business of his Hawaiian tenant. So we only have one choice here, which is to go out and look for a job. So you're on your way to San, Le Le uh, San Le Le Leandro Bait and Tackle, which is run by Jack Fitz, an old friend of your parents. He's always been good to you and has even talked about how unfair this whole inf internment deal is. He might be able to give you a job or maybe just a place to stay. As you make your way down 3rd Street, though, you can feel people looking at you. You hear whispers of Jap at least twice. Once, you turn around and an old white lady is blaring daggers at your back. It feels like everyone just knows how long before someone calls the cops. So do we want to run back to our car? It's not, worth the, it's not worth the risk of getting arrested. Do you want to stay calm and keep walking? They don't know who you are. All you have to do is make, make it one more block. Well, I've been sitting around my apartment for the last three weeks, so I'm going to keep on walking. What do you guys think? Well, we, get, we got a clue in the text there. It says, you've heard whisper of Jack at least twice, so it's not as if they don't know who you are. I mean, unless if they, you're just in denial. I think mm -hmm. even the surgery didn't do that much good. I think you shouldn't stay calm and keep walking. I think you should run back to your car. Go back to your car. Okay, and as chair for clarification, yours was run back to the car as well? Or is yours to keep walking? Uh, run back to the car. All right, so run back to the car. You don't make it more than half a block before the police cruiser up, cruises up to the curb and too many of her hop out. The younger one reaches you first. He looks a little apologetic. Excuse me, sir, he says, but can I see your ID? So our response is, sorry, officer, I must have left it at home. Or why do you have a warrant? Why do you have a warrant? Is it a crime for an American to walk the streets now? Hmm. I don't really ever see myself leaving without an ID. So, but I don't see being that. Yeah, there needs to be a third that says, sure, here's my ID. <laughs> <laughs> right. And this is conflict either way. So this is this is one of those interesting things where there's the, the writer of this interactive picture, there should be a third choice here, which is simply, yes, here's my here's my ID. But anyways, what do you think we should do? Do you want to say, make an excuse? Or do you want to, do you want to get sassy? <laughs> Trish, what, what, was your, what were you going to say? 
I was saying, I was agreeing with Chris that, I mean, neither of those answers is really good because number one, you're already kind of freaked out because you're trying not to be noticed and you are being noticed and being belligerent is not going to help. And so I'm wondering if when the writer wrote this, if they actually thought anybody would choose this path, <laughs> because honestly, I'm kind of wondering, you know, I don't know that anybody would make those choices because you would not want to be belligerent because you're going to get arrested for being belligerent and demanding a warrant. Well, is it like if there's anybody who's really going to honor that? <laughs> I think this is a good uh, later segue as a preview later that we have to talk about the ludic fallacy. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> so, so I guess what, so I guess Trish and I will vote for the more polite response, which would be, sorry, officer, I must have left it at home. I, I agree because the other one is too contentious. I mean, realistically speaking, you know, you don't, you don't really want to challenge the officer. I go with the sorry officer. All right, so he said, so he left it at home. So the cops took you in anyway, and now you're sitting in a San Francisco jail cell. They let you make a phone call to Ida, but her dad answered, and once he heard who it was, he hung up. The good news is, is you didn't get assigned a public defender, is that you didn't get assigned a public defender, a guy named uh, B-Sig, the director of American Civil Liberties Union. Somehow heard, uh, someone heard about you and it was in a couple of days of your arrest. And he asked that Wayne Collins, a civil rights attorney, be personally assigned to your case. They set up a trial date next week, June 12th. Collins says you've got a fair shot and that there's no way the court's going to hold up the internment as constitutional. He said you might end up becoming something of a celebrity, a poster boy for American democracy. That doesn't sound bad. Continue. It's June 18th, and Bissick just posted $5,000 bail on your behalf. You're a free man. As you and Bissick step out onto the street, however, Three MPs block your way to B6 Ford. You need to come with us, Mr. Suzuki, they say. One of them has a firm hand on his gun. You look at B6, he says, just go with them, Fred. We'll get this figured out. So we only have one choice. The MPs took you to the Presidio, leaving you to rot in yet another jail cell for, for the last three months. Collins and B6 have been visiting you pretty regularly. There's no word from Ida. Well, that was fun while it lasted. You wonder if she's found some other guy, a nice Italian doctor like her parents always wanted. Another court date has been set for the next week, September 8th. Evidently, they're going to try you for something called Public Law Number 503, violating military orders issued under the authority of an executive order. The trial was a farce. You got five years probation, but it doesn't matter because you went from the courtroom straight to the, the Tanforan Assembly Center, and now you're on a bus to Topaz, Utah, because we've always loved wanted to go to Utah. Uh, to be placed somewhere called uh, the Central Utah War Relocation Center. The only upside is that you'll get to see your brothers and your parents again. Evidently, they've been in Utah this whole time. Finally, you step off the bus, the bus and you're greeted with a massive barbed wire and a grim-looking place called Topaz. You find your parents pretty quickly. They and their brother, three brothers are living in a tiny cramped shack on Block 3. They're happy to see you, but it's pretty hard for anybody to muster up enthusiasm about much of anything. And basically for the last week, nobody in the entire camp has been able to talk about anything except what they've been calling the loyalty questionnaire. Yes, Kay. Okay. So this is, this is a point where I think if you don't have a lot of time to play with your students, you could come to about here. And then you can have them to start start looking up the facts. Now, when, when it comes to this Japanese when it comes to the Japanese internment camp, this definitely is a place where you can stop and have them and have them go ahead and start looking for people. So Chris, I'd say that at this point, why don't you get out of it and we'll go ahead and look at the next one. So, so Chris, this part we would like you to introduce us to this part of the history regarding the Japanese American German and Fred Korematsu. Um, so you can actually click and take us to that January 30th report by TechCrunch, which is just this January 30th, 2017. 
Yes. And and Chris, if you don't mind, yeah, huge words, yay. <laughs> so on January 30th, it was uh, Google celebration of Korematsu Day. Uh, essentially, you know, as a civil rights leader, he's a real person. So what we, we just did was we, we played a game um, that's based on a real person, and Google devoted its Google Doodle on January 30th to celebrating this person. And Chris, you want to take over reading some parts of that? Sure. It says Google is celebrating civil rights leader Fred Korematsu's with its uh, Google, Google Doodle today on the day it would have marked his 98th birthday. Korematsu was born in Oakland, California. Sound familiar? The Japanese immigrants. He went into hiding when the U.S. President Roosevelt issued an executive order sending people of Japanese descent into living in the U.S. into internment camps. Uh, Korematsu went into hiding instead of entering the camp voluntarily. That sounds very familiar. And was, arre was arrested in 1942 for fleeing the order. He was then imprisoned in a camp in Utah until the end of the war. Korematsu was later issued the Medal of Freedom by Bill Clinton following the events of September, uh, sorry, and following the events of September 11th. Uh, he spoke out about how the U.S. should not go down the same path with those of Middle Eastern descent as it did with, pe with people of Japanese heritage during World War II. His famous quote attributed to Korematsu is, don't be afraid to speak up, something he advised all Americans to do in the case of something, something in case something was wrong. So I think what I want to add, and thank you, Chris, for reading that, is he is seen as a leader of resistance and a voice for civil rights. And the idea is that he is saying we should speak up. We definitely should speak up if something is wrong. Um, this was very timely, and uh, we don't know if it's a political move from Google or not, but certainly it was a great day to celebrate this man um, in consideration of that immigration order that we just experienced. Okay, so I think we can go next. Next one. Okay, there's, there's another game uh, that we can play, and this one is called The Migrant. And I think we're going to ask Chris, who has a lovely reading voice, to help us with this next game. Okay, Chris, you go for it. All right. I'll go ahead and uh, get started. So Mr. C. Evans, uh, created this, the migrant, can you, give, can you give your family a better life? Uh, you, are Ad, you are Adnan, a young man in his 20s, uh, married with two young children. You herd goats on the outskirts of Aleppo in northern Syria. You live a simple life. You're very photogenic, especially when you have the cute little goat. Uh, you often dream of living in the city or maybe going to see other countries, but your wages only stretch far enough to pay for food, such as a lamb and flatbread. Still, you're happy. So what do you want to do? Do you want to stay here and raise your family? Or do you want to leave the capital city of Damascus? You know, given that we're talking about dreams, he said, you often dream of living in the city. So if it's our dream, staying here and raise their family might not fulfill whatever that dream is. I go for leave for the capital, Damascus. Okay. Damascus. <laughs> I think as well, though, though you do get to, I think you have to leave a little cuddly uh, lamb behind, though, unfortunately. Uh, so go to Damascus. So uh, go ahead, you arrive in Damascus with your family, uh, and your family share a small room in your cousin's apartment. Hey, it's nice to get family around. Work is hard to come by, and you face the prospect of living in a shanty town. Life is hard. Do you want to stay living here, or do you want to go back to Aleppo because the city really wasn't what we thought it was going to be? I say we stick it out. What do you think? Well, you know. Usually it doesn't, dreams do not come true immediately, I think. I mean, it's, it sounds like hardship, but I vote for stay here, living here too. Yeah, stay a while longer. All righty. You managed to get a job, but the pay is low. Your children can't afford to go to school, and your son, Marwan, has become involved with a gang. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> you question whether or not you made the right choice. You move for economic reasons, but you can easily move back home. So do you want to remain in the city or return home to Aleppo? Hmm. 
at this point, if your child is starting to get into things like that, I think at that point, I would go back to Aleppo. Okay. Hmm. This one is, is a tough choice, too, because you're thinking of your children. But I wanted to see what, what would happen when we do remain in the city. So I, I go think, for that one. I think I'd be toughing out just a little bit longer, so we'll see what happens. Year, uh, years have passed, and, or a year has passed, and your life has really not improved. You're no better off than you were when you lived as a farmer in Aleppo. You hear news that a group of rebels has tried to overthrow the Assad regime. You worry that the country may descend into civil war. Do you want to stay put, or do we want to head north to the Turkish border so we cannot go home? <laughs> oops. Yeah. That was like an oops decision that we made. Um, well, you know what? The, the image looks pretty threatening, and that's from Reuters. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking we probably should, like, go away. And I guess our option, the only option is head north to the Turkish border, so I go for that one. All right. Turkish border. And Trish did, see, Trish was nice. She didn't add the, I told you, go home. Uh, so <laughs> go ahead, north to the Turkish border. You've arrived in uh, uh, the Akakail. I'm sure I'm destroying it, near the Turkish border. You are safe for now, but you're told the war is spreading north. What? And to go the east further, there's a separate war breaking out in the east with ISIS. So what do we want to do? Do you want to try to enter Turkey or stay here and plan our exit? Seems the war is following us. Go to oh. Turkey. <laughs> I don't know. This one's really tough, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, go to another country or try to stay in the country you know and plan your exit. Hmm. Well, waiting around didn't didn't really help us out last time. So <laughs> Well, Chris, you'll be the tiebreaker. I'm I'm just gonna say stay here and plan your exit. I'm not sure. All right, well, go ahead and we'll I say let's try to go to Turkey and see what happens. You wait until the early morning light and head into Turkey. The Turkish authorities have built a fence, and you see with men with guns, uh, guns ahead. But look, they're really small men. See, you can tell in the picture. They're very tiny <laughs> compared to the refugees. So <laughs> do you want to stay here and wait until dark, uh, or do you want to try to go over to the, over the fence? Growing up in a farm, I can tell you, running over and hopping over the fence is never a good idea. <laughs> I agree with that. Now, have you noticed your choices are getting worse and worse <laughs> and worse? It's like you've got a choice between bad and worse. So at this point, I'm no, I'm not for climbing over barbed wire fences. Just sit down. I'm gonna. This is not fair on my part, but I'm just gonna make Chris the tiebreaker. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> Try to get over the fence. So, of course, you're going to have to help us. <laughs> All right, let's go for it. Let's go for the fence. You hear about a hole in the fence six miles out of town. You head there at dusk. You manage to make it through and spend the night in the desert trying to avoid Turkish troops. You have no positions other than a small bag and two bottles of water. It is cold, and you have no, no shelter. Yeah, uh, you arrive at the road junction. All you can see in every direction is desert wasteland. You have no idea where to go west, go next. And then they go back to Zork. So you can go west, you can go east, you can go north, you can go south. <laughs> Didn't we went? We originally went north, right, Chris? Yes, yes, we went north to Turkey. Yes. Mm. So going north again would go further in, right? That's what we're assuming. Yeah, I don't know. These are tough, man. These are tough choices, huh? So I'll, I'll just randomly pick West because how would I know, right? That sounds that sounds horrible. Okay. okay west, so west. West. Yeah, let's go west. All right. Man. We'll go ahead and head west. Uh, it says, it says, you go west. You've arrived at one of the twenty-five uh, refugee camps set up by the Turkish government. 
There are over 1.9 million Syri uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey. You and your family are safe. A refugee is, some, a refugee is someone who has fled their home due to real fear uh, or of harm or death. The camp is a sprawling area consisting of over 25,000 semi weatherproof tents donated by charities. There is little water, little space, and disease is rife. Supplies arrive daily, but there is never enough to go around. You have been at the camp for two months. Conditions are awful, and more people arrive each day, many with the bomb blast injuries. Nobody is allowed to leave. The Turkish government has sent troops to keep the refugees inside the camps. So our choices are a range of protests against the inhumane conditions or try to escape the camp. You know, given the Syrian refugee, given that there's not a lot of um, aid, that enough aid mm -hmm. given to the situation with Syrian refugees, I think that arranging a protest against inhumane conditions probably is going to be futile. Um, the, the, the power that be might not be listening. And I'm thinking maybe we have to be risky and escape the camp. Okay. I'll go with Sherry on that one because once again, it's a choice between bad and bad. So yeah, escape. All right, we'll look to escape. You spot your chance to escape from the camp. In reality, it's impossible for the authorities to keep track of the ever uh, of the ever increasing numbers. You walk for days when you meet a man who says he's able to help you get into Europe. You need to pay, but you have no money. He explains that you could sell a kidney to pay for the journey. Do you want to refuse or accept? I like my kidneys right where they're at. <laughs> getting darker and darker, huh? It We're is. Getting to a dark place. Yeah. Um, I'll. Hey, I'm gonna be on there. I'm gonna make Trish break the tie. I'm gonna say, yeah, I'll sell a kidney. Um, <laughs> Trish, you're gonna have to think about this one. <laughs> sell the kidney. Let's uh, see what happens. Uh, you know, yeah, sell the kidney. So we're gonna go ahead and sell our uh, kidney. You accept and spend the next twenty days recovering in a dirty backstreet hospital. You are weak and at risk of infection. You have no, you, but you have money and you press on towards the west. You must move at night to avoid the police. Now you have a big decision to make. Will you head north into uh, Bulgaria or head to the Turkish coastal town of Izmir? I feel like it's random chance right now. Mm -hmm. You know, because how much news do we really get, right? If, we, if we're on, on flu and we're escaping and there's not much news, how do you know if it's going to Bulgaria or Turkish? I mean, I, I'm it, Izmir. I'm just going to randomly guess Bulgaria, and it feels scary either way. Mm -hmm. So, Trish, what do you think? Bulgaria. All right, we'll go there. This was the route that many Syrian uh, refugees originally made. However, there's been a huge political movement across Europe to extend the movement. So, Bulgaria has bowed to pressure and constructed a giant fence across the Bulgaria Turkish border. The 30 kilometer fence is manned by armed soldiers. Soldiers, people have been camped here for months. This is a dead end. So now we have to head back to Izmir. Looks like. You arrived at Izmir. The place is brimming with migrants and coyotes, gang leaders who will arrange your passage to Europe for a price. There's little support for migrants here. You won't last long without food. You find a coyote and agree to a price uh, for a boat trip to Greece. You arrive at the beach five miles outside of town at 2 a.m. So your options are propose, propose, postpone the trip as you fancy catching a big football match on the TV tonight, choose boat one, choose boat two, choose boat three, decline and stay in as mere and assess your options. Uh, so I think what we're options? <laughs> There's not much. Uh, watch, you know, watch soccer uh, and uh, postpone your trip. Uh, or your option is to decline altogether, and uh, the option is to pick a boat. So I'd say I pick a boat. Well, it doesn't matter which one. Oh, geez. A random, I'll say boat two. I don't know. Boat two sounds good. I don't know. Yeah, let's go with two. And we do have a question from Padlet. A question from Padlet is, 
uh, they, the, the individual unfortunately missed the start of the presentation and was wondering if, what tool was if we knew what tool was used to create this IF. This was made by the text adventure. So it's play uk. So you can actually just go to textadventure.co.uk and we'll put the link available for you guys. So this was an internal uh, internet fiction tool that is used there. But if you use their tool, everything has to be published and open access for everyone to play. Okay, that's the condition of the text adventure um, site. All right, we'll go ahead and go to boat two. You grab your life jacket and cling on to your family as the overcrowded boat bounces over the rough sea. By luck more than judgment, the boat makes it to the shores of Greece. You kiss the ground. Over 300,000 Syrians have entered Greece in the past six months. Compared to the crisis where uh, around 60,000 Central Americans have entered the U.S., this is a scale unseen before. To amplify this further, the U.S. has a population of 360 million. Greece has just uh, 12 million citizens. In some Greek uh, islands, Syrians' arrivals outnumber locals by, by two to one. You should be safe in Greece. Maybe it's time to claim asylum. A, an asylum seeker is somebody who enters the country illegally, but then tells the authorities it is unsafe to return home. The authorities must prove that it is safe in order to send them back or uh, grant them temporary residence or asylum. If you choose not to claim asylum, you will remain as an illegal immigrant. In theory, if you claim asylum, you'll be granted the right to stay in Greece. But given the sheer number of migrants and the economic situation in Greece, neither you nor the Greek government want you to stay. They bust you to the border of Macedonia. Macedonia. So what do we want to do? We can either tell the Macedonian bordermen that you wish to claim asylum, or do you want to sneak into Macedonia? So, Chris, we know that this game probably goes even longer. Yes. And I'm thinking to save you. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe this will be your last choice, okay? I am thinking, hmm, you know, I, we wonder if Macedonia is openly accepting anybody. That's a, that's a good question, isn't it? Because if you say, tell the Macedonian border man you wish to claim asylum, we don't know from this information if they're actually accepting anybody. So maybe I'll do the sneaky way. I'll sneak into it. I don't know. And I would say just because we've been sneaking the whole time, I think that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and try our luck once again. And uh, I think we'll sneak. Uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll sneak into Macedonia. Same. This is you pass the border guards. You seem rather overwhelmed by the influx of migrants. You have a lot of travel ahead of you. And we have other choices. Go to Hungary or go to Croatia, Albania, Montenegro. So with that, we'll go ahead and we'll hop back to the slides. And we'll continue on with our presentation. So thank you, Chris, for reading all of that. I mean, that was a pretty intense one. Um, we had some choices, and I think it was based on some of those realistic choices that migrants are left with. I mean, the, the refugees really life left with, you know. So they don't really have any choices. That's what we're learning right now. So we decided, I mean, a lot of people think that games are not based on anything realistic. So here is some information from Mercy Corps that was posted on October 13, 2016. So, Chris, if you don't mind clicking or going to the website for us on this refugee crisis. Okay. Let <laughs> me switch the screen here. Okay. There, um, in the infographic, I mean, this is actually from the site. If we, if we go to the site, we can look at the site specifically. But okay, I think we're switching for a second. Um, on here, at least on the infographic, before we go to the site, right, it does say that approximately, and this is based on October's number, that about 11 million Syrians are actually on the run, including 4.8 that were million that were forced to seek safety in neighboring countries. So when we played the game, there were some neighboring country that accepted us and some of them that just refused us. And it was hard, based on our experience of the game, 
which direction we're supposed to run to because it seems that every direction since we are lacking in information and we're on foot it's not as if we get access to the news so everywhere we go we're just randomly guessing right we're going east south northwest we're even guessing on which boat to get on and i think our group probably is extremely lucky that we randomly chose group boat two because who knows what would have happened when you chose boat one or boat three right since greece was uh, very welcoming to us um, but right now, that's the hard statistic right there, is that 13.5 million are still in need of humanitarian assistance. And that's a pretty rough number um, to, to see, because that's a lot of people there. Okay. And are we able to get to the site? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> okay, sure. Okay, so I think we're just going to go to the next, um, the next slide here. And this particular one, we're not actually going to play it. It's actually an indie game. It's pretty famous, and I think it came out in two thousand four or a little bit earlier. Um, oops. Please, yes. So Papers, Please, this is actual website for Papers, Please. And the punchline is, congratulations, your October labor lottery is complete. Your name was pulled. <laughs> this is one of the most simplest indie games, but it's also done beautifully. Okay, An indie game is made by an independent uh, developer that's usually not backed by a major publisher. Okay, So Duke Coke was the designer of this game. And the experience of this game is like this. You, you play as the immigration border officer, and what you're supposed to do is to stamp on people's passport, either accepting them into the country or denying them from entering the country. And the country is a fictional place, so they didn't name any specific place. But what exactly is your experience as a first-person player? You're trying to experience what it really would be like as an immigration officer. And some of the effect um, of people, we hear a lot of uh, people um, replying to the experience of paying papers, please, which is that when you pay papers, please, you feel joy at the mechanical, the mechanicalness of it all, which is you stamp, accept, or deny, and you start doing it over and over again without really thinking of the implication of what exactly it is that you're doing. And the people who co come through the border or, or go through the immigration are the people who range from little children to, to adults to, to married couple to old family members and so forth. So you get all kinds of people trying to get through the border. And sometimes because of upper up, uh, your government telling you you have to do certain things because your life is also being threatened by the government. You just do things mechanically. You say yes, pass, or no, you do not get to pass. So the effect was that yes, you enjoy the mechanic by playing through the whole game and saying yes, I am, I get to decide the life or death of these people. But at the end of the game, when you finish, the phenomenon is that boy, what? What exactly did I just do? Did I just turn away a whole bunch of refugees who actually needed help from our country? So I can pass this back to Kay. Do you want to say more? And and the thing that I the thing that I wanted to say um, about this is chances are you might have students who have played this game and who have played this game a lot. So if you're bringing in and we've showed you two interactive fiction games. And, and you can make decisions on how you want to play them inside, inside your classroom. But you might have students who start referring to this. So we wanted you to be aware of the game. And I think Sherry did a really good job explaining that, you know, Papers, Please is not a game that, that, it, it, that will help bring, you know, make your students empathetic or, or understand the plight of anyone. But despite that fact, you still might have to go ahead and discuss it. So, Sherry, okay, so the other thing I wanted to put up, here is a, here is a, really, a, a really nice site that you can also go to uh, that is looking at the amount of Muslims um, across the world. It's the Pew Research Center, and the Pew Research Center does great research when it comes to, and I know this sound, it sounds like they're different things, but I, I love it for both, for technology use and also for religion. If you, if you watch PBS at all, you'll see that the, the Pew Research um, Center actually has a 
a show once a week on looking at, at the state of religion. So they do really good research on this. So that's it's a place to go, and that's why you also find a lot of facts about about refugees on this also. So it's another site that we wanted to show. And if you go next, Chris. Okay, so we we showed you two interactive fiction games. We also wanted to let you know about um, papers, please. And and here's really why we're all trying to do this kind of rapid response. Uh, us as educators is is we really wanted to talk about games and the effective domain. And there's three domains of learning. Now, the one you hear about all the time is cognitive, and you see, and you hear about Bloom's taxonomy all the time, and you have to use your action verbs for Bloom. Well, there's two other domains that are, are really neglected. One of them is the affective domain, and the other one it was the psychomotor domain, but you could go, you can move forward on the slide. So there's actually three of them. And when we're talking about these games, what we're really talking about is the effective domain. Okay, now, um, now Bloom did this with Crothwall, and Crothwall was also involved in the cognitive domain, but he really specialized on this. And when you're looking at this, the effective domain, you're looking at attitudes and awareness. You're seeing if your students, are they able to listen and respond in interactions? Can they, uh, can they demonstrate the abilities or characteristics that are appropriate for the situation? And for me, at my college, we talk about uh, this a lot as is a learning outcome as professionalism. Can your students understand what's going on? And we have a lot of students that um, graduate with allied health degrees. In fact, in our Colorado Community College system, a student is more likely to graduate with an allied health degree than any other degree. So this is really where it comes into play. You want your students to have the cognitive skills, but you also want them to have the, effect, uh, the skills from the effective domain. And if you'll go to the next slide, so this is just some things for you to think about. And, and think about it, if you were doing these interactive fictions in front of your class and having the discussions. What do you want them to be thinking about? And we'll, we'll start at the bottom. And just recently I read a really great research article and it was actually about anesthesiologists and how in medical training they really want to emphasize the effective domain because it's not just about how well you can do the surgery or how well you can do the diagnosis, but you're going to be dealing with people the whole time. And what makes you, and what comforts someone who is going to say um, be put out anesthetized for um, going into an operation what do they need to hear what do they need from you okay this first one of receiving that's just paying attention the next one responding actively participating and interacting with new information think about this you want this from your doctor you want to, you want your doctor real you know listening to you responding to what information you're giving to them and then valuing um, your doctor actually believing that that whatever information you're giving them is worth something and that this is new information and not just thinking this is routine and checking the box now the next part the organization and characterization we really see this when with our medical students when we are having them take ethics classes when they are taking philosophy classes and even religious studies classes and the reason is is because in, in our area you know our, our the, the religions are very diverse so we want our we want our students in allied health to understand what if the if their patient is muslim what's going on there if their patient is buddhist what's going on there and not all automatically assume that every patient they have is Christian and every patient they have is going to have the same value system and so for us the effective domain means a lot and if you think about soft skills and what you hear from employers and what you want even with your students who get a liberal arts degree you want them to be able to do this and you can bring and what we're really trying to do here with between ISTE and ELK 
and this multiculturalism is we want a rapid response. We want to give you a couple tools that you would be able to take into your classroom, adjust as you need to, and really bring this across to your classes. Because you're going to have some students who are t affected by this. Um, at my college, we have a good um, population of students who um, are Muslim. We also have students who are Hmong. Um, both my, may have come here at, from refugees. We also have a good population that is Russian and also Hispanic. We don't know how what's happening, what's happening today, and how it's going to fit into our students' lives. And are they worrying about themselves, their loved ones? Are they worrying about their family? And I mean, so these are things that can be brought up in the classroom. You might have a lot of students who, who aren't personally affected by this, but who still, you want them to be able to respond in situations, not, not only in their jobs, but for the rest of their lives, that they can see what's happening, a current event, and be able to empathize, react, and, you know, depending on what it is, even, even move forward with their own actions when it comes to this. So if you go to the next slide, Chris, this was just another. This was just another visual, <laughs> in case in case you didn't like how we totally ripped off the Bloom's Triangle taxonomy that you see everywhere else. These are the big things, okay? Starting at the top and then moving down to the bottom, from listening and receiving that information to responding, going all the way to making that information now part of your schema, okay? And so go to the next one. Okay, so wanted to put this. In, and Sherry's going to put something in there quickly also. Um, I want to mention broad interpretation of the ludic fallacy. The ludic fallacy, you might not have heard this term before, okay? This term really came out from a statistician who was talking about how Wall Street Journal's economic simulations don't always work out, <laughs> work out the way that they're supposed to, okay? So I want to put a little caveat that while we were giving while we were giving you some examples of interactive fiction that you can bring to your classroom, there are student sensitivity that you have to think about, and we're not saying that either one of these interactive fictions are the same as the, as anyone who has gone through this experience. These are just ways that we want to bring forward again tools that you can use, that you can bring in as an educator, and that you can have these discussions. And you saw you saw how we went through these kind of as a group. You can do it that way in class, or you can have students do this individually. You can add them questions for more research or whatever you want. And so Chris, if you go to the next slide, uh, Sherry's going to say a quick rebuttal to me. <laughs> Thank you, Kay. Before I say that rebuttal, um, I just want to add from the game studies people who were looking at, I mean, there's many scholars that try to go after this ludic fallacy business, but essentially it's this, right? A game is actually a set of conditions, right? It, well, let me say it this way. Game is a rule machine, okay? It institute rules, specific rules with specific conditions so that the game can actually run. A game is never designed to simulate every single possible condition that gave rise to an event. So, for example, when we were playing, for example, the, the, the Syrian refugee game, The Migrant, it is not supposed to simulate every single possible condition that gave rise to that. Therefore, there is that disconnect, which is you're saying, wait a second, this is not really reality because I can remember this event and that event, and what if this condition changed? If I add a new condition with the whole game a change outcome. So, therefore, you're not supposed to see the game as a one-to-one -one simulation of reality because it never can be it's it's a fix and its limitations okay so here's my rebuttal <laughs> to the ludic fallacy really quickly first of all if we understand okay acknowledging that understanding games as a one-to-one -one representative of reality is a falsehood it's wrong-headed then we have to think about what exactly is the value of using games to teach first of all like a book no one is going to suggest to you that if you read a book about, for example, the Syrian refugee, that that is the only possible perspective on the issue at hand, right? So you don't tell students, go, that's the book, and you trust everything that's in that book. Same thing with the game. 
game presents a perspective like a book. So it offers one perspective, but it's not the end point of all uh, interpretation. So when we assign games to students, the way I approach it is, okay, let's talk about this one perspective. What is limited in its perspective? What conditions can you add to this game that would change the outcome? Um, for the game. So this is how we test it in a philosophy course, because I teach philosophy. And this is what we think about conditions and rule changes, how it would change the total outcome. And Kay, you want to say something more there? No, I, I, I'm pretty good there. I'm ready good to go on the next one, because the next part is a little bit of an example of that. Okay, here was a game. Um, it's called it's called 1378, or it is in German. And what it is, um, Here's the thing. When it comes to rapid response to what's going on now, we're hearing we're hearing a lot of executive orders and things that might be changing. We're hearing about a wall being built across the border from the U.S. to Mexico. Well, there was another wall, and this this other wall divided East Germany and West Germany. Here's what I would suggest. I would suggest talk to your history instructors, talk to your history professors, or just look around and see if there's someone at your at your school or college who might have actually been a veteran during this time period. Okay? And and the reason I'm bringing it up is bring people in who have been around there to go ahead and to go ahead and and talk about what it was like. I mean, rely, these games are one resource, but also look for other resources. The reason I brought up this game is because this game was panned as really not doing a good job at this of the situation, um, but and and showing what it was like to be at that at that border. So as always, we suggest if you can't find a game that works, think about think about doing your own. And when we say game, if you've noticed with me and Sherry, games don't always have to be nothing but a static fun, okay? Or, or social fun. We, we, I mean, for me personally, if a game, I'm looking at game-based learning, so if a game teaches, that's fine. If I look at an interactive fi piece of interactive fiction and you don't end up winning at the end, that's fine too. The, the other thing about it is people, people know Doffer is dying a lot. You don't win that game. I've played it with the students in the computer lab and the taking over the whole computer lab and the students playing it. Students don't win. And you have the discussions about what's, you know, what are the topics that are being brought up and how this feeling of never being able to win, never getting it right, actually works. So go ahead and and click to the next slide. So back to what I want to say is the uh, effective domain. You've you've seen this. When you're looking at games, play the game and see if this is coming across. Does this help with an attitude of awareness? Can you stop during the game and can students talk? Can they listen? Can you have a discussion with different points of view? Okay, and then also think about when the students are playing this game. How do you relate this back to the subject area that you're teaching? And go ahead, click again. So we'll go quickly through this. Now, I found, I happened to, since we were thinking about the East Germany and West Germany, I did happen to find that someone was offering um, an escape room about called Tear Down This Wall. Chances are they're doing it more as a, the Cold War spy genre. So I just want you to be aware that um, you can go ahead and you can have your students create games. Um, I've... I've been brought into a certain anthropology class on a number of times where we've decided instead of giving students a game to play, we're going to have them do this using the ARG or a pervasive game format. And go ahead and click the next one because I want to tell you if you wanted to create your own one, there is so much material out there. If you wanted your students to look at something, say, like the Eastern and West German border, these uh, these were documents that I easily found that I was able to just Google and get them and that could be used for discussions or um, used for a folder left for students to investigate something more. So Chris, if you'll just go ahead and click, we're almost done, but just some of these things are out there. They've been declassified and they're and they're just sitting out there on the web for you. Okay, so 
just go ahead and click through. I think there's one more, or if not, that's the last one. Yes, some very good pictures that you can use for discussion. And like I said, you could have students, you could walk in with a folder of pictures and tell students that, that this was recently found and that they have to do more research on this and explain what's going on. And you could even you could even make it that kind of experience okay and so now we're just going to be ending up to so go ahead and click so our closing thoughts in and then your sherry will jump in here too but um, use use these games as a prompt a prompt for discussion a prompt to, for you to look at the effective domain interactive fiction can be used well with a group with a group of people um, the other thing, that folder could totally be the, the folder with the different things could totally be the start of a, of a project for project-based learning where you're having the students go out and come up with something completed from this. And the other thing about this, what we did today, we're much shorter than we usually are, but what we did was we didn't have a month to prepare or grab materials. We were just looking for a rapid response. Okay, the executive order to protect the United States from terrorists entering the country. That happened at 4.42 p.m. on Friday, last Friday. So a little over a week later, we tried to get, just grab these resources so that, so that you might be able to take some of these into your classes. So I'm going to give it to Sherry to go ahead and give her thoughts. <laughs> okay. I do have a couple of things to say. One is that I've always uh, talked to students idea about um, making designing projects, whether it's making a game or writing stories or publishing articles as a form of social activism. So when we are when I make students play these interactive fiction, I don't really want it to end us, oh, we learned a lesson. Well, that's that's you know, that's analysis 101. That's that's the basic stuff. But then the next step, when we talk about project-based learning, yes, you can use interactive fiction tools to make them create a project, which is what we usually do in a philosophy class is we take a game down and we say, let's list out all the possible con conditions and also the assumptions behind some of the rule sets that we're playing in this game. So we list all the uh, conditions. Then and then another separate sheet, students actually create new conditions that they say, well, what if this could have happened? Or what if that could have happened? Then they list another sheet, okay? So it's a design process. Then when they're going to make a game, whether it's an interactive fiction or an actual, you know, digital game, they put in their new conditions, maybe do some new graphic design, and then put it into the game to give us a different alternative universe view on what could have happened with the game you know if all conditions are perfect and the world is perfect therefore the game will, will fall fall in that way so i think those are the different ways that you can use games so i don't think that we should think of these games as the end point but the beginning this is why i think it's very apt for for uh chris and Kay and everybody else to say that games is a prompt right should serve as a prompt for other things yes Okay, so we're going to be wrapping this up. This is our first attempt at a rapid response to current events. I'm sure we will get better at this. Okay, <laughs> and there will be more. Um, this was from ISTE Game System Network and, <laughs> and the eLearning Consortium of Colorado. <laughs> And we're just flipping through the things we already had there. Like Chris said before, we have lots of resources on the Metagame Book Club site that we, we have done book clubs on interactive fiction and lots of other topics that might be useful to you. Okay, so this is the last slide. And so we want to thank you very much. And we're going to wrap it up now. Um, we do have a document out there. Feel free to go in and to post things, and we're going to keep putting things up. Um, you know, as far as far as we're concerned, we're educators, and like um, Sherry said, the, the, you know, some people some people could march very well. Some lawyers showed up at the airports last week to help people. Um, this is going to be our attempt. We're going to try to find resources for you so that you can take them into the classroom and so you can also learn more yourself. So thank you very much and goodbye.